Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 79 of the podcast. And today I want to share the quilt story about Hot Cast. This is a goddess quilt I created in 2011, and it was interesting. I actually went back and read the blog post that I wrote back in 2011, and you know, kind of had a little blast from the past moment, which was really good. Uh, and it really, um, I think more than anything else, being able to go back and read almost like a journal entry uh, about what was going on and what was going through my head, I think that's really good. And this is why I continue to blog even now. Uh, I, I love having that uh, that documentation and, and being able to look back. And in five or 10 years, you know, my life is going to be very different. James is going to be grown in 10 years. He's going to be out of the house. He'll be 21. Oh my gosh, <laughs> that's hard to believe. Uh, so having the blog is, uh, you know, it's it's really is a wonderful journal in that way. Uh, so I hope that you enjoy hearing about Hot Cast and the inspiration behind this goddess quilt and uh, how it went to construct this particular quilt. Now, as for what I'm working on today, I have pulled out my electric spinning wheel. And if you can hear it, that's the little noise in the background going on now. Uh, I love my little electric spinning wheel. It's, you know, if you think about it, an electric spinning wheel is a little bit like a sewing machine. You know, you're doing something by hand, but you've got a motor attached to it. <laughs> and uh, this is something I love to do in the fall. And we finally, as of this week, finally started to get some cooler weather. Uh, that it has been hot, hot, hot uh, throughout August, September, and even into, and it's now the middle of October. We're finally getting a little bit of cooler weather. So that's... That's been nice. And, uh, you know, just this week we finished up the Leaf Peepers Quilt Along. You can find all of the posts now that we've shared. Sherry from Whole Circle Studio and I shared posts every Monday for the last 10 weeks. Uh, and you can find all of them now linked up together. Check it out at leahday.com slash leaf. And this past Monday, I shared a video just on how to wash your quilt. Uh, so if you're you know, feeling confused about that, and this is one of those things I get asked about quite a lot. You know, um, it kind of went into the line a couple weeks ago. I did a video on storing your quilts. Well, caring for your quilts, you know, comes with that. You don't want to put away a dirty quilt, you know, wouldn't want to make a hanging uh, or a, a tube, a storage tube for a dirty quilt. You want to wash it first. So yeah, make sure to check out that tutorial. leahday.com slash wash is where you can find it. I did get some questions about that because, you know, in basically washing my quilts is very, very simple because I pre-wash all of my fabric. So I don't feel any hesitation or fear about taking my quilt once it's finished and bound and throwing it in the washing machine and you know turning it on the the uh the turning on the machine you know i don't i don't feel any fear about that it doesn't scare me in any way because i know that that fabric is uh dye free it's not going to be leaking the colors aren't going to migrate i'm not going to have any issue because the fabric was already taken care of at the very beginning of the project but i did get a few questions and one in particular um the quilt Quilting Stash asked, if your fabric is pre-washed, uh, that's a great way to wash, but if you use pre-cuts, charms, layer cakes, or strips, these can't be pre-washed. How do you handle washing a quilt made of these? Very good question. Um, in that case, pretty much do the exact same thing. Uh, you know, I throw the quilt in the wash and make sure it's nice and evenly balanced within the drum of the machine, and then I throw in three or four die grabbers. And that's about the best that you can do. The other thing that you'll need to make sure to do is to grab that quilt as soon as the wash is complete and throw it in the dryer. Because I find most bleeding does not happen when the quilt is being actively washed. It happens whenever it's left soaking wet, wadded up in a big mess in the bottom of the washing machine. And I'm particularly bad about forgetting my clothes <laughs> in the washing machine um, and, you know, just kind of leaving them there soaked and, you know, then it's a mess and, it, you know, soured and the whole nine yards. So, yeah, you don't want to do that with a quilt, especially when you have not pre-washed the fabrics. If it's made out of pre-cuts, you can't pre-wash those. Uh, so just be, uh, you know, set a timer on your phone or, on a, you know, on, a, on your uh, oven or somewhere that you can hear the alarm go off and go and check on your washing machine. So as soon as that quilt is washed, throw it straight in the dryer and get it dry quickly. And you'll need to 
be that careful with it every single time you wash it. Uh, my quilt that bled, it was my very first quilt, it did not actually bleed until the sixth or seventh time that I washed it. Uh, so, you know, it can give you a false sense of security that your quilt is safe and you might start throwing it in there with, you know, with other clothes, with other colors. And then that one time that you forget about it and leave it in the, you know, soaking wet, wadded up in the bottom of the washing machine for a few hours, that can be the time that those dyes finally loosen up and start to migrate and, and wiggle around a little bit. So watch out for that. It is, it is one of those things that uh, I know stresses out a lot of quilters and causes a lot of, of worry. And I do think that using yardage and washing it all can really save you, <laughs> save you a lot of stress. <laughs> but that's just my opinion. So uh, a couple other things. This week, uh, I'll be honest, I haven't been as productive as I usually have been because I got this terrible cold uh, over the weekend. And it was one of those weird colds where I didn't actually get snotty or I didn't have a cough, I didn't have a sore throat. Um, it just only affected my brain. <laughs> I know this sounds really weird. Uh, so I had body aches and complete brain fog the uh, sun Sunday and Monday, and I couldn't think. And it was really, really frustrating. Uh, I had several projects that I was trying to, you know, write or plan out and I uh, wanted to work on. And I, I literally, I kind of stood in front of my cutting table, like staring at fabric and I couldn't make up my mind how to cut it or what sizes. And I stood like that for like 10 minutes until I finally said, okay, Lee, you just need to go to bed. You know, this is, this is bad. You just need to go to bed. So it really made me feel uh, happy once I got well uh, and very thankful that I don't get sick very often. And at least it wasn't, you know, big snotty nose or the whole nine yards. That's always a pain. Uh, but before I got sick, we had a big day outside in the yard and I got into my wood shop, my workshop, and started, just took a look at the place because honestly, I've been, I've been in a state with my wood shop because it's been taken over by the Singer 12 treadle for the last several months. And I finally reached a point where it's just like, this thing has got to get out of here. I want to get back into wood turning. I want to make some Christmas ornaments and some gifts for Christmas. So I really need the treadle put back together again and out of the barn. It's taking up too much space. So really got ambitious about that. Um, pulled out the Singer 12, got it taped up and took a can of spray paint to it. Uh, yeah, it's definitely going to need another coat and uh, learned a lot, you know, it. This is, this is meant to be my learning restoration machine. That's how it was designed. I mean, I only paid, I think, 60 bucks for this machine. Uh, but it's still, it's so easy to kind of just start feeling like something's really precious and, and then get bogged down with it. And that's why it ended up taking so much time is that I kept making it more and more complicated to get finished. So, you know, at first it was, okay, I'm just gonna take it apart, clean it, and then put it back together again and see if it'll work. And then it became take it apart, clean it, get all the rust off, and then um, and then paint it. And then it became take it apart, <laughs> you know, get all the rust off, paint it, but fill in all the cracks and crevices and do, you know, basically I, it was kind of a metal filler, like an auto body filler, kind of a Bondo putty. And, you know, I was looking at the tube and the, you know, list of precautions and fumes and I'd need to wear elbows, you know, I got gloves up to my elbows and wear my respirator and the whole nine yards and even still do it outside. I was just like, you know, I'm tired of this and I just need to get it done and I don't care if it's perfect. You know, the whole point, this, this is a, you know, 140 year old machine. I don't care if it comes out just exactly right. In fact, actually, you know, I'd rather it have a few nicks and dings and the paint not be 100% even. Uh, I think that's a-okay. So I didn't end up using the putty. I just grabbed my can of spray paint. I got all of the um, the wells, the oil wells and stuff taped off so that way they wouldn't fill up with paint and gave it a good spray. And I should be able to go out and do another spray in the next day or so. You really want to wait between coats. And I got to say a special thank you to my friend, Cheryl Warren. Uh, she is uh, the treadle lady that I had on the podcast a few months ago. And uh, her blog is Dragon Poodle. You can look her up, uh, dragonpoodle.blogspot.com, I think is her name. Uh, anyway, she advised using hammered finish 
spray paint and it gives you kind of a, a texture that hides the worst of the you know where there was existing paint that wasn't coming off and where you have basically bare metal um, it kind of evens that out just a little bit I think another coat though or, or two will definitely help and will definitely even it out even more so I'm looking forward to that uh, I'm looking forward to getting it done. I'm looking forward to it not being in my wood shop anymore because I have so many other little projects, little fun things that I really want to be working on. Uh, and I'll be honest, I've kind of run off on a little tangent for Miss Bunny. Um, <laughs> I started looking on Pinterest. This is very dangerous, by the way. Just proceed with caution if you decide to also search Pinterest for the same thing. I started looking up um, like doll accessories and doll uh, doll houses and miniatures and the whole nine yards. There is some crazy cool stuff out there. Uh, and of course, then I was like, okay, well, I made Miss Bunny so many dresses. I need to make her a closet too, right? So I, I found a box uh, at the craft store and turned that into a closet. But, you know, it could just be like a plain box. You know, I wanted to put special feed and, you know, now I'm wondering if I should put doors on it. And I've got some little hinges and then I might stain it. I got two different small things of stain. So, yeah, I'm running off on a little tangent here, um, you know, playing with this stuff. But, you know, it's fun. And I really believe that it's important to follow whatever is inspiring you at the time and um, playing around with the stuff with this with Miss Bunny has been a delight it really has been and I know I'm just scratching the surface with what I want to do with these dolls from Mally the Maker and uh, you know and having you know cute things to prop up with her and I might even do tutorials on how to do this stuff that would be incorporating woodworking it would be incorporating you know um in some cases a little bit of furniture design you know it'd be playing around with some stuff I've never played with before but I know how to do and that would be a lot of fun too I feel like it's kind of funny I feel like Mally the Maker is kind of unblocking me it's allowing me to to teach things uh that I, I don't know, I guess I felt like I couldn't teach that. I, I'm a quilting teacher, like I define myself very rigidly as that. And then, um, and then I've kind of gotten stuck a little bit with that. I can, I can knit, I can crochet, I can spin, you know, I can teach these things too on little projects um, for the dolls. And I think that will be really fun and it'll be a great way of diving into these little crafts too. Uh, and I gotta say, guys, thank you so much for your kind comments. Last week, I shared uh, the first chapter and a bit of the second chapter of Mally the Maker and the Queen in the Quilt. And there are times when I do something and it's scary. And that was one of those times. And I, uh, I always have to just remind myself, like, you know, it's okay to be afraid. It's okay to be afraid that somebody doesn't like what you're doing. It's okay to put yourself out there. And I think Neil Gaiman, I think it was, that said that, you know, if you feel like you're walking naked down the middle of the road, then you're doing it right, something to that effect. And that's exactly what I felt like. Because, I, you know, I really didn't know how people would react to the first chapter. And, you know, my worst fear was that someone would contact me and be like, I hate the book, give me a refund, which did not happen. <laughs> You know, but I, I'm not I'm not lying when I say that it's scary. You know, it's scary to, to make something and, and uh, Mally the Maker does feel very, uh, very personal in the sense of, you know, it's a fun story that I created and it's an awesome world. And I just I hope everybody else loves it as much as I do. Uh, and yeah, it was it was really, really an, an excellent affirmation that it's good and it's good enough and that was really really helpful last week so thank you to everybody that shared nice comments uh, on that podcast uh, and please go check it out if you haven't listened to that podcast it's about an hour long and you get to hear you know the whole beginning of the story how Mally ended up in Quilst the magic world inside of a quilt and uh, now I have set up my closet uh, I need a really really solid audio and not the level of audio that I normally get in all the different places I record the podcast uh, because I do video with the podcast 
I, uh, I don't, <laughs> I guess I kind of, I don't really pay much attention to the, as much attention to the audio as I should, uh, which, you know, is indicated by I'm always clattering around or messing with something in these podcast episodes. But for the audio book, I will not be filming that. That will be audio only. And it needs to be super, super high quality. So I looked around my house. I was kind of like, all right, where can I record this and have really consistent audio um, where, where is it, you know, good, good, um, what's the word acoustics where, you know, the sound is kind of muffled and, uh, it's not echoey. And I thought about, I was like, well, my bedroom closet, <laughs> that is the only, only place in the entire house that has good, that, you know, that kind of, um, set up. And I actually found a little tutorial on how to, how to turn a closet into a recording studio. And you actually don't need to move your clothes, which was surprising to me. In fact, actually, I'm going to be adding all of my quilts, all of the folded quilts that we use on the bed. I'm going to be packing the closet full of them to reduce the space even more, to bring the, the noise down even more. So that'll be fun. I got a little table set up and a little laptop set up and my little microphone set up so I can kind of <laughs> set in the closet and start recording the audio for Mally the Maker. And uh, Josh came upstairs last night and I was kind of testing it out and setting in the closet. He opened the door and he was like, so what are we doing now? <laughs> You're now wanting to work in the closet too? And uh, I, you know, my goal is to break it down and record one chapter a day. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to maintain that uh, solidly throughout. I think I'm gonna need a lot of practice ahead of time uh, because it took me, you know, it took me an hour to record the first chapter of Mally the Maker. So I think, you know, I'm just gonna have to take it day by day, do some practice, do some editing, play around with it. But my goal is one chapter a day and there's 14 chapters in the book. So uh, I don't know how much time it's gonna take uh, to do the editing and then there's a whole other different kind of platform as far as putting an audio book out there. Uh, I know there's Audible, um, audible.com is an Amazon company now uh, and it's governed through ACX. So there's a whole different side of the stuff that I've got to even learn and, and set up accounts and all that kind of stuff. So I don't know when that will be available. I haven't even started recording it yet, but it is definitely going to happen. And it's largely going to happen thanks to all the wonderful comments that I got on last week's podcast. Um, it really helped me believe that not only was I doing a good job with the narration, that it was interesting and no one hated my voice. <laughs> <laughs> so no one told me to go get my day job back. <laughs> so that was comforting. So I'm looking forward to it. And I'll be honest, I have loved reading out loud since I was a little girl. Like that was my favorite thing in class. If we were, you know, if the, if the teacher was calling on people to read out loud, I was the first person to raise my hand. I love giving different characters voices since I was a kid. Um, the other students in my class liked it when I read versus other people. So, I mean, I, I feel like this is a skill that I've had that's been largely untapped. And then now being able to read Mally is just a joy. It really is. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait to do the bad guy's voice. It's going to be a lot of fun. And there's a lot of characters too that even as I was writing it, I would read it to myself and do voices when I was in the writing process. So yeah, as you can tell, I'm super excited about that. I will be recording in the closet starting today. So uh, <laughs> that is what I have been busy with and I'm so glad, I'm so thankful. My brain is working again today so I can think and uh, get some projects done. Here is another little thing that I have been working on. I've been stitching out lots of embroidery and this is a little embroidered zippered pouch and I'm playing with embroidery and trying to come up with more projects to do that you can make with my embroidered squares. So uh, I have three collections now that stitch out a 3.9 inch square, which is a hundred millimeter hoop. So that fits into the smallest hoops that embroidery machines can come with. Uh, and I feel like that's important because, you know, sometimes get started with embroidery. It's expensive, especially the bigger and bigger hoops that you get. Those are come with the bigger and bigger machines. Um, so you can get cheaper machines and play with embroidery and kind of get your feet wet. And, uh, you know, I, I really think it's excellent because it's a great way of stitching things out and looking so awesome because these are free motion quilting designs stitched on a tiny, tiny scale 
not easy to do when you're learning it from scratch, but with a machine embroidery, it's as easy as, you know, hitting a button and then watching it stitch out. And I love watching it stitch out, it's so much fun. So I took this, I made a really ugly bag. I, was, I kind of got done with it and I was like, that is the ugliest thing I have ever made. <laughs> <laughs> I don't always show you my flops because sometimes they're just bad. And a lot of it had to do with, I was kind of using up lots of, of miscellaneous fabric colors and you can see they, they don't really go all that well together. Um, so it's like purple and blue and orange and red and gold and green. Mm, yeah, and then it would be fine if I had used like one color of thread color, like a white throughout, it would probably be a little bit less awful <laughs> but but I used contrast like really bold contrasting thread colors too I can laugh about this because I know how atrocious it looks but I'm testing out the zippered pouch idea and playing around with that and I'd love to know if you would like to see zippered pouches or pin cushions or you know what kind of little tutorials would you like to be able to stitch out an embroidery and then sew those things together and then make something else? If you've got an idea for something cool, let me know. Uh, and this is uh, using the zippered pouch tutorial that I shared. You can find that at leahday.com zippered pouch, I think, uh, leahday.com slash zip pouch. Yeah, that's right. That was the link that I used before. And I've added these little tabs on the sides so that if you wanted to, you could add a um, a strap and carry it as a purse with uh, a little hook. You'd have to add a little D ring to these little tabs. Yeah, and I think I need an updated tutorial on how I'm making these bags now and also something to play with with machine embroidery. So I'm having a lot of fun with that and mostly just, again, challenging myself to try new things and the first stitch out, accepting the fact that if it doesn't come out right, it's okay, it's not the end of the world. Like that first bag that I made, I showed it to Josh and I was kind of like, what do you think? And I was cringing <laughs> before I even asked. And he kind of took a look at it and kind of cocked his head to the side. And you know when someone has to cock their head to the side, it's gonna be bad. Um, yeah, it was, it was bad and he was like, well, no, <laughs> those colors are all wrong and that bag is all wrong. Let's, let's try again. So yeah, more tries definitely in order and it's fun to play. You know, the thing I have to keep in mind when something doesn't work out, number one, how can I cut it up and turn it into something else? And that's exactly what I did with this zippered pouch. I sliced up the one that didn't work and turned it into something else this morning. And that felt really, really good. But then the other thing is also, you know, what did I learn from it? And it's definitely to be careful with thread color and fabric color, unless, you know, it's like one or two colors mixed up, but not mm, 12 different colors mixed up. That really didn't work. That, that turned into a mess. So that's pretty much it for what I've been working on around the house. And now here are a few sweet comments from YouTube. Uh, Tara S said, it was fantastic listening to you read the story. I would love it as an audiobook if you were reading. I listened to it while I was adding the binding to a quilt and the time just flew by. Can't wait to find out what happens next. And Miss Maddie also said, ordered the book last week and now after listening to you reading it so beautifully, I am even more excited to receive the book and read the rest. And that, again, just... I can't tell you how much that makes my day, guys. It really, really does. Uh, and uh, one more comment from Deirdre. She said, Leah, I love the beginning of your podcast when you talk about finding balance. As a 50-something who has quilted and crocheted all my life, I have been working on that balance. It changes in different stages of life, but we are always trying to find balance. I think you could live by quilt slash crochet alone, but our families might not enjoy thread or fabric for dinner. No, they probably wouldn't. Thank you for all your inspiration. Please keep it coming. And thank you so much, Deirdre. That was super sweet. And you're right, completely right. Balance is everything. And it's, it's a continually flowing process. It really is. You know, uh, when I feel the urge to, you know, jump into a new craft lately, I've been trying to temper that with, you know, and I kind of resisted pulling out my spinning wheel for a few days because it's like, I've got so many other projects that needed to get done first. So I tried to reach a stopping point with what I had uh, on my on this table before I pulled out the wheel. 
But I think it's, it's, you know, that's the balancing act. That's the tug and pull of, I want to be creative. I want to make beautiful things, but I also need to stay balanced. So I don't have so many creative things out and about that it's driving me nuts. Uh, and that can be a factor too, definitely. Uh, there's only so many projects that I can keep, you know, rolling around the house before it just starts to feel overwhelming. Uh, and balance can come in with family too. Uh, a couple years ago, we instituted like a family time, you know, basically kind of a cut off for work time uh, at four o'clock when my son comes home from school. And that was really, really good. And it's something I still try and stick with now. In fact, actually, I'm trying to stop work at about 3.30 so I can take a bike ride. Josh got me a bike for my birthday. And so I'm trying to take a bike ride every day and uh, even just, you know, biking to the grocery store and back and having that time for myself um, where I'm not working and I'm just enjoying, you know, just being alive and being 35 years old. <laughs> you know, I, I kind of feel like that I'm living in the best part of my life. I know that sounds crazy, but every once in a while I kind of have, have stepped back and I look at my son and he's 11 years old and he's not yet in that like totally angry teenage phase. He's still got a little bit of sweetness, you know, and I, every once in a while I just kind of feel like, man, this is good. This is a good life. And uh, appreciating that and loving that I think is so, so important. Uh, so two things here right at the end that are really cool. Um, first off is SAF, that's the Southeastern Animal Fiber Fair. If you live in North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, in any of these surrounding states, you might want to come to this. Uh, it is a huge fiber festival for all things wool, roving. Uh, they have animals up for auction uh, to buy, you know, like sheep and goats. Uh, and angora bunnies, that kind of thing. Uh, they have tons and tons and tons of yarn and uh, fiber to spin and felted wool. It is amazing. It really, really is. I came last year with a friend of mine and we had a blast going through all the booths. I bought lots of wool, lots of knitting needles, and I would love to go back this year. So I think that's an awesome fair. It's not quilting related, but we can take those materials and absolutely apply them as surface art to our quilts. You know, wool, uh, wool quilts are super popular too. Uh, and you can find, you know, nice thick chunky yarns. I did not see any electric spinning wheels there, uh, but I did see a few regular spinning wheels, but really it's a fiber show. You're going to buy raw fiber or yarn. Uh, you know, they had lots of dye, lots of paint, that kind of thing. Thing. They had a really awesome loom that made a shawl. It was a triangular shaped loom. And I've been not forgetting about that loom this whole year. So I might end up looking for that the next time I go. Uh, and it was uh, it was collapsible and the guy was trying to, he was trying to sell me on it really, really well. And he was like, you know, you, you could pull it out and make yourself a triangular shawl and then collapse it back down again and tuck it under your bed. No one will have to know you have this giant loom. <laughs> Yeah, that is really appealing to me. Um, so yeah, th there's that. And that is October 26th through the 28th. It's in Asheville, North Carolina, uh, on the um, Western North Carolina fairgrounds. Uh, so near the airport, if you're interested in that. And then the other thing, and this is the reason why I'm not so sure I'm going to be able to get to SAF this year or not. And that is Heart Square, H-A-R-T. Heart Square is Awesome. It is truly a North Carolina gym that has been completely hidden away as it is awesome. It is the largest collection of historically preserved log cabins in the United States and they open one time of the year uh, and that is for the Heart Square Festival and it is October 27th. So tickets are on sale now. They're $45. And uh, basically it is all of the log cabins opened and not just that, they have uh, demonstrators and docents there, you know, guiding you through, showing you what it's like to live uh, during the log cabin, you know, pioneer days. All of the log cabins came from that county of North Carolina. This is not, you know, log cabins from all over the United States. This is only uh, preserved from that area of North Carolina. And they're not just empty houses. They have been filled with furniture and tools and antiques from that era as well. It is, 
it is so amazing. It's so immersive. Uh, when I, I went this spring, they had a little um, kind of a fundraiser event and they're doing, I think they're gonna start doing more little events. And then you can also book out the whole area for a wedding uh, and, and for different special events. And I think schools can also go there too. So I think they're increasing how open they are, but this big event for festival on October 27th is the like the big thing of the year. Uh, so when I went, they had some of the buildings open. They didn't have any docents. They didn't have anybody dressed up, you know, like, you know, spinning or anything like that. Uh, and we could just tour the different buildings and learn about where they came from, you know, uh, the stories behind them. They have an actual old schoolhouse, you know, that, you know, basically the guy that built this, he just kind of started a collection of log cabins. It's a ra rather random thing to collect, but uh, he started doing research and, and asking, you know, at the time, this was the 1960s or 70s, you know, asking the old timers where they went to school and, you know, and, and, and where did they, um, where did they go after school? And, you know, where did they hang out and what, who did they know? And all that kind of stuff. And then they started finding these barns, you know, kind of tucked away on people's properties that were actually old schoolhouses and, you know, churches. And, you know, they'd fallen out of disuse. They had been replaced by a newer building. And then the, you know, the log cabins then kind of fell into disrepair. And so Bob Hart would take these buildings and basically take them apart piece by piece and carry them over to his land uh, where Hart Square is and then reconstruct them piece by piece and, and put them back together again like a jigsaw puzzle and then decorate them and, and fill them with antiques that were um, correct for that time period. So I just find that fascinating. I really fell in love with the place and I will be demonstrating there on October 27th. Uh, I have a costume. <laughs> it's Halloween month. So of course I've got to have every excuse I can to dress up. Uh, I don't know how it's going to work. You know, I just kind of signed up as a quilter and so I'm going to take some hopefully historically accurate fabrics with me and be doing some hand piecing, which I can do standing or sitting. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, and then if there is another crafter that has a, you know, bigger project idea, then obviously I'll be flexible with that. This is my first time ever going to the festival, so I'm really excited to see how all that works. And I just, I'm excited to be a part of it more than anything else. So yeah, that's a lot about Heart Square, but as you can tell, I am really excited about this. I can't wait to dress up. Uh, I can't wait to see what everyone else is doing there. I can't wait to see all of the log cabins being used and fires in the fireplaces and, you know, the whole basically village coming to life uh, as it would be back in the pioneer days uh, or the Civil War area. It's kind of um, the, the log cabins range in age from very early colonial America to Civil War area. And I think the latest one is like 1880. So that would have been about the age that my Singer 12 treadle was made. So it kind of puts it a little bit in perspective. So yeah, I really am looking forward to these events. I don't know if I'll be able to do them both. I am a very introverted person and I have to watch my energy level. <laughs> you know, I'm being out all day, talking to people all day is definitely a push. And then trying to do that a second time and going to staff, that will be even more of a push. But you know, I sometimes feel like we have to push ourselves, uh, especially on special weekends like that and kind of go all out and enjoy it to the max and then, you know, recover later. In that case, it's a little bit out of balance, but I really wanna to go to both. <laughs> and there's another event at my son's school too that I'm kind of wondering, it's like a Halloween kind of trick or treat kind of thing. And I'm wondering if I should dress up as flower girl for that, you know, really embarrass the pants off of my middle schooler. <laughs> so we'll see, I, like I said, I'm gonna pace myself and kind of, you know, kind of see what I can take on, but I'm really excited and I can't wait to participate in all of these fun things. So that's pretty much it for what's going on around the house. And now here is the episode about hot cast and really working through that desire and need for perfection in a quilt and needing that perfection to prove something about your self-worth. That's really the major lesson that I took from this quilt. 
Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to this podcast episode about Hot Cast. This is a goddess quilt that I started in 2011, and it was a fairly quick goddess. I think I went from start to finish in about six months, which is pretty speedy <laughs> for me, definitely. Uh, and this quilt, let's just start with the inspiration for it. Actually, I'll start by describing it. Uh, so this is a relatively small wall hanging. It's about three feet wide by about four and a half feet long. Uh, and it has a, uh, a goddess with a black body and her body has a very large heart shape in the center. And then coming out from that heart shape are uh, vine, like uh, veins, uh, like flaming shapes that uh, are uh, going through her body. And I painted those a bright gold to make them look like it's uh, molten metal flowing through her body. She has bright orange and yellow hair. Uh, some of her strands of hair I painted gold as well. This was when I was really experimenting with Jacquard uh, Lumineer textile paints. Still love those paints. They're absolutely wonderful and uh, they really make some really interesting effects on fabric uh, as far as getting that really nice metallic look. Now, the one thing that you'll uh, definitely be able to see if you're watching the video uh, and you can come and see images of hot cast, uh, you can find that at leahday.com slash hot cast. You can see that she doesn't have arms. <laughs> I cut off her arms and I also uh, cut off her legs. So I'm holding up the quilt here and you can see so here you can see she also has no legs. I pretty much cut off the shape uh, at mid thigh. And so she doesn't have knees. And uh, what she's doing, she is kind of propped up, stepping up a set of stairs. And I painted those uh, silver, different colors of silver, again, more metallic paints. And this was a quilt that I really doubled down on symbolism. Uh, I dug into books on symbolism, specifically the Freemasons uh, and different signs and symbols from that uh, secret society. And I had a book on it. So I was just like, all right, let's throw all the, the different th things that I can from this group and, and all of those different meanings. So I have a big blazing sun, uh, the columns, the archway is also a symbol from the Freemasons. The checkerboard uh, path that she is stepping up on, the staircase itself, all of those are different signs and symbols from the Masons. And this is interesting because uh, it would be another four or five years before my dad would become a Mason. Uh, so, you know, it was just one of those things that I got interested in, kind of mentioned it to dad, uh, encouraged him to look into it, and then now he's a Mason. So I think that's kind of cool. There are green vines that weave up the columns on the sides, uh, and those are painted green. There's a lot of paint on this quilt, and, you know, and I would say, uh, the main reason for that is I knew that there was a lot of fiddly applique <laughs> here that I had designed and what I drew could be fiddly applique or it could just be painted. And just like with all of my quilts where I run down that tangent, uh, I, I think this is going to save me so much time. It's going to be so much easier. And then it ends up not being that at all. But I'll definitely get into more details with that in the construction process. Uh, in the background over the little checkerboard platform she's standing on, there is a landscape and uh, then a sky that I painted with colored pencils that fades from kind of a purple to a very light blue. And those are recurring themes in my goddess quilts. You know, sunshines, landscapes, uh, big open skies. Those are recurring things that come back time and time again. And it's actually really funny. Uh, I was kind of questioning that the other day, like, oh, well, you know, do I really need to do another goddess quilt? You know, I've kind of done these symbols and signs to death then you know, like, and, and I haven't really been feeling pushed in that direction. Uh, and I listened to a great podcast episode with Joanna Penn, the Creative Penn podcast. Uh, and she had just come back from a conference where she'd taken a class and uh, this was about book writing, but it still, I think, pertains to quilting. It pertains to design. Uh, and basically the uh, instructor had said, whatever it is that you like to do, even if it is recurring over and over and over again in your art, continue to do that thing, continue to put that out there. And that was really nice. That kind of freed me up and made me feel like, okay, I can keep 
playing with these elements that is still, you know, there's still sometimes I'm like, oh, well, it would be really nice to do, you know, a long skinny goddess quilt, you know, have it horizontal and it would be fun to make an even bigger sunshine. You know, I have these ideas and sometimes I feel myself getting in my own way and saying, oh, no, 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 you've already done that before. You know, I think that that is getting back to that little judgmental voice in our heads that can really hold us back. So hot cast was definitely a quilt. You had to get into the inspiration for it, why I designed it this way and the emotion and, and ideas behind it. Um, this was designed during a time and it's actually really funny. I look back and read all of those old blog posts and I'll link them up for you so you can read them too. I actually got this quilt confused, it flipped around in my mind with Emergence. Uh, Emergence was a quilt I shared in a podcast a couple months ago, and you can definitely go and listen to that one. Uh, but that story, you know, was very chaotic because I kind of started a quilt called Sinkhole. I burned it. <laughs> I literally set it on fire in my backyard. Uh, then out of that, uh, I made Emergence. And that quilt still has some kind of I don't know, just some weird juju with the design and the colors and still wasn't 100% happy with it. And in my head, I was thinking, okay, well that happened in 2011 and Hot Cast happened after that. Actual fact, it happened the other way around. Hot Cast was first and I had started Sinkhole and then folded that quilt up and put it away. And then making Hot Cast was kind of my processing time of trying to to decide if I wanted to finish Sinkhole or not, you know, and, and how do I, how do I stop this negative voices in my head from comp basically trying to destroy me? And more than anything else, how do I learn how to love myself? Now that question, how do you love yourself? I truly believe that that is one of the most important questions to ask, but maybe not ask it in that direct way. And I can, read those posts that I wrote back in 2011. And I, I kind of have a lot of um, both gratitude and compassion for that girl that was only, you know, seven years ago, but I can see what I was struggling with. And I can see how I was attempting to, uh, you know, to go after this goal. Like, you know, I, and I actually wrote, where is the love myself button? <laughs> can, can I just push it and be done with this? Uh, but I was focusing so hard on the idea, on the thought that I didn't love myself, that I didn't accept myself, that I didn't believe I was worthy of nice things or good things happening in my life. I was focusing on all of those negative emotions and negative thoughts to the exclusion of simply deciding to be happy and deciding that I was worthy and deciding that I was good enough. And I know this might sound a little contradictory. So, you know, can you honestly make that choice? Can you make that up your mind? Just simply that, you know, I'm going to be happy today. And in 2011, if you had told me it was that easy, I probably would have laughed at you or gotten angry with you because uh, I had it in my head that it was supposed to be very hard and it was going to be a lot of work. And I needed to do make, make this a big deal and make it a lot of effort. And it was going to have to be very, very tough. And then, you know, only if I was strong enough and, you know, endured the hardships, would I emerge at the other end and be capable of loving myself and be finally feeling like I was worthy of my life. And I probably wouldn't believe you if you said, well, you know, could just wake up in the morning and simply say, gosh, thank you so much for this amazing life to start the day with gratitude is an amazing gift to start with and to start the day acknowledging just how amazingly lucky we all are uh, just simply to exist and be able to smile and laugh and cuddle with someone and make you know warm fluffy quilts to go on the bed we are insanely amazingly lucky to be able to do all of these things and starting the day with gratitude first kind of makes everything, all the chips fall into place because then it's no longer a question mark of, do I love myself? Do I not love myself? Am I worthy? Am I not worthy? There's no longer that debate. Instead, it's just simply thankfulness from the very beginning. You know, I exist. Thank you 
for letting me exist. And that thank you is going to whoever or whatever you believe in. And, you know, I think that that was the major learning experience with this quilt is uh, it's not about um, demanding uh, or the struggle or the work to love yourself. It is instead just simply setting and accepting and having those positive thoughts on a daily repeatable basis, you know, and to stop questioning. I know that sounds crazy, that it could be that easy. And I know that, you know, in the past, I wouldn't have trusted that. Uh, but I truly believe that being happy and believing in yourself is a habit. And there are a whole lot of things out there that are designed to make us not, you know, want to build that habit, you know, oh, you need this other product and oh, you need these cosmetics and oh, you need, you know, we're, we're constantly being told that we need all these things to make us better and to make us worthy. I uh, read this book, you know, this self-help book is going to fix everything for you or this person has some great ideas, that kind of thing. Uh, and I truly believe that we all have the capability of loving and accepting ourselves for who we are already within us. And it starts by not questioning anymore. Just simply, I exist and I'm so thankful that I exist. And, um, and that, I think, is the basis for self-acceptance. When I designed this, you know, I, I had that mentality it was going to be a lot of work. And where I was coming from with the imagery was from um, casting sculptures in a bronze foundry. This was the job that I worked with my dad when I was in high school. My dad was kind of the manager of this foundry. And, uh, and I was sick of, I was making subs at a Quiznos. <laughs> and I was just really kind of tired of, of uh, that whole nine yards. And I wanted to do something more creative. And he said, well, I think you could, you could do wax work for us. It was lost wax casting. And so I started working at the bronze foundry when I was in 11th grade. And it was great. It was awesome. You know, I, I pretty much got my hands in all stages of the bronze casting process, which is, um, it's really interesting. You know, it's very dirty, filthy work. And uh, I'm very happy that I don't do that now, but I'm very happy that I had that experience then. Uh, and the casting process, just a little bit of description, you make a wax mold of the statue and typically, you know, if it's like, let's say a statue of a woman with her arms raised and, you know, there were a lot of famous sculptures, sculptors that we were doing their, uh, their sculptures for them and we would do repeats. Like I can remember one summer we did like five of the same Venus statue, a woman with her arms out and kind of draped with fabric and stuff, um, all in metal, all in bronze. And, uh, you know, so we'd, we'd have the same statue come through repeatedly if it was a very popular sculptor. And so we'd have a, a wax cast of that statue and we'd cut off pieces. So we'd cut off and just have the torso so that way the bronze, whenever it was molten, would flow into that area and be able to spread out fully and it would not get kind of stuck up in her elbow or something like that. We'd cut off the bronze at those places. And then after it was cast, then weld all of those pieces together and then grind the heck out of it <laughs> until all the seams were, uh, were you know, disappeared and basically look like a solid piece of metal. And so that's really why her, she doesn't have arms and why she doesn't have legs is I was pulling from that imagery of you know, taking a big piece of a woman and cutting off those pieces so that she could be cast in bronze. And, uh, you know, it, typically her head would be cut off too, but I thought that was going a little extreme. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, after the wax, uh, then we would uh, cover the bronze with uh, basically kind of think of a cement uh, layers of sand and slurry and, and sand and slurry and that would build up and basically kind of create a um, a a mold of that wax. Then we'd heat that up and the wax would melt out and then it would basically be a shell, a, a cement shell that then molten bronze would pour into that. And that was the idea with the center heart and all of the fiery uh, veins running through her body so that kind of reminded me of the sprue bars. So we would take a, you know, like let's say the torso of a statue and we would weld 
uh, or, or you know put little bits of wax so that way we'd have a central funnel that we would be pouring the bronze into and it would come down these bars and into the statue and if you didn't put enough bars in there then it wouldn't work at all uh, so you know the goal was to make sure that you know you were successful filling that statue completely with bronze because otherwise you'd have to start all over again from scratch and that happened once we didn't have enough bronze made up uh, there wasn't enough melted and ready to go and they poured a leg and it got up to about three inches from the top and then there wasn't enough bronze to finish filling the leg and it was yeah we had to start all over on that one from the very very beginning it was not good so um, yeah just a little bit of an interesting side from bronze making and I that was the idea that was the inspiration that I was coming from and and that was definitely something where you know I was, I was also trying to tap into you know this was something I did with my dad and I love my dad and you know we had this special time together and working for him was not always easy <laughs> I gotta admit you know sometimes uh, things would happen you know a mistake would be made and uh, you know some part of the process and uh, you know sometimes dad would make an example of me which is not a lot of fun but uh, you know it was definitely you know part of our relationship you know was was built uh, working together like that and I was able to handle that you know uh, and not you know I, I could take the level of effort and work and I think that made me a better worker it made me a better person it made me a more responsible adult later on so all of that was a good thing it wasn't easy but I think it it helped to make me a better person and that's really where I was I was trying to pull from my roots and put something into this goddess quilt to try and prove to myself like, yes, you know, I know how to do these things, you know, yes, I'm creative and yes, I'm worthy of love and acceptance and uh, to have a good life. So I, you know, what's interesting is at this time when I was designing this, I actually designed two quilts back, kind of back to back. They were kind of sister quilts. And the other quilt was called Forged and Welded. And uh, that quilt was pulling in imagery of uh, watching my dad forge. My dad's also a blacksmith. And one of my favorite things to do when I was a little girl, I would be hanging out at my grandma's house. And at my grandma's house, it was a big old farmhouse. Uh, and there were several outbuildings. And one of the outbuildings was my dad's blacksmith shop. And so from, basically from the TV room in my grandma's house, I could hear my dad pounding metal uh, across the yard. And uh, every once in a while, I'd you know, throw on a coat if it was wintertime and, and go across the yard and, and visit with him. And uh, I just sat in the back of the blacksmith shop and watch and, you know, dad would heat the metal in his forge until it was bright red and then pound it on his anvil until, you know, flatten it out, making the shape that he wanted. Uh, and he'd always told me this story about a sword that he'd started. It was like a short little sword that he'd started and didn't remember what happened to it. It had ended up kind of tucked away in a corner and he'd lost it. Well, uh, 2004 or five, his shop burned down burned to the ground, gone, uh, really, really, really devastating, uh, and ended up having to, you know, just scrap pretty much everything out of that blacksmith shop. And this is one of those things, we've got to be thankful with quilting, other than our irons, which really is a very safe craft. Our chances of burning our house down uh, for, you know, doing something with quilting are very, very minimal. You know, my husband is into fish, uh, the fish hobby and he's known friends that have burned their houses down from messing with aquariums and doing crazy things you know we just recently had the the little bit of a flood from a fish tank so you know it's good we've got to be a little also gracious the fact that we are quilters <laughs> we do things with fabric and it's really not that dangerous yeah so dad's shop burned and uh it was really traumatic because you know this was where he'd spent so much time and it was basically kind of always a second job um, for him to be making things in addition to the job that he was working and you know and it was also it was the place that I would go and hang out you know not necessarily chatting or talking or whatever but I just hang out and sit on a stool and you know mess around on the back of the shop and stuff while my dad worked and then all of a sudden it was gone and uh, you know but in that cleanup dad found that sword and he cleaned it up and finished it and gave it to me when I was pregnant with James. So that sword kind of 
had this, you know, it kind of was a little mythological, like, you know, I, I, I had searched for it and looked throughout the shops for it for years. And then, you know, the shops burned down and then dad found it and fixed it and added a hilt and the whole nine yards and then gave it to me right before I had my son. Uh, and so I kind of pulled that imagery of that sword, actually even started with a photograph of that sword and built a goddess off of that. Um, but this is one of those things. It was a lesson of you have to, when you're inspired to do something, sometimes that inspiration, you know, sometimes it'll be patient with you. And Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic, really kind of delves into this. And I, and I, I like the way she describes it. I find that most of the time my inspiration is very patient with me. You know, if I feel inspired to go spin or I feel inspired to go knit or I feel inspired to go play in the wood shop and do some turning or something like that, then typically then that will stay fairly patient with me and, you know, give me a month or two of leeway and, you know, I'll get out there and, and you know, but that's the really, honestly, the quicker I can follow that inspiration, the more happy I am, uh, the better whatever I'm going to make it is going to be, and uh, the more satisfying fulfilling that urge is. So if I want to spin, if I'm feeling the urge to spin, if I have the yarn or the roving right there to go play with, following that as soon as it hits is always the best thing. And it, you know, it might last, you know, like 30 minutes and then I'm done. And it's like, all right, well, yay, I got that you know, taken care of and now what? <laughs> Do I go knit that yarn that I just made or, you know, something else? And so following inspiration, I feel like is, is really important and it's not something I can always do. You know, sometimes I've already got five projects in motion and I absolutely can't go pull out my wheel or, you know, pull out knitting needles or pull out another project and more yarn or whatever. Um, sometimes it's just too much and I have to put stuff on hold. I think that was the situation that was going on whenever I had these two quilts back to back. I had forged and welded and I had hot cast and I had a choice, which one do I do? And I knew I wanted to do hot cast first. You know, it was about learning how to love myself. And I you know, had this ambition, this desire, I've got to put the work in so I will love myself, you know? Uh, and if I seem a little tongue in cheek about this, I, I honestly can look back at this and be like, God, this is un slightly immature, yes. Uh, but also, you know, I think my heart was in the right place. I was, I was trying to be a better person. And even back then, I was questioning whether I should be drinking as much as I was back then. I mean, that's written in a blog post. And I read that. I was like, even in 2011, I was, I was questioning whether that was a good habit in my life or not. It would take me six more years to finally decide that that wasn't good and to quit drinking completely. Um, but you know, it's, I think it's a testament to how long we can come, how, how far we can go. And I do think it's good. You know, I love that I have those old blog posts. I love that I can look back at that and reflect on how much has changed what I knew then. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's easy to, to lose these lessons, you know, it's easy to forget and let things slide a little bit. So. I decided on hot cast and I ran off with that quilt and then I kind of kept forged and welded that design on paper and I kept coloring it and coloring it and coloring it and I just could never get the colors right. Uh, every time I played with it, it's like it just, it kept becoming a mess. It was a very complicated quilt I had. Like it was, it was basically like a, a, a goddess with a sword for a body emerging out of a swirling sun uh, with flames coming up and, you know, radiating lines coming through, you know, the, the sky area. I mean, it was very, very complex. And I was trying to pick different colors for all of that. And it just really just didn't work. And um, I fought with it and fought with it and fought with it. And then finally, it just ended up being one of those designs that just, it was drawn. I colored it a little bit. I played, I tried to make it work. And then the inspiration left me. And then that was it, you know? I, I, you know, the desire, the ambition, the drive to have to make that thing left. And then, you know, I have a nice pretty image and it's kind of fun to color it, but that's about it. 
And Forged and Welded was more about that triumphant feeling of like, yes, I've, you know, I've got this. I mastered this whole loving myself thing. And, you know, uh, kind of, um, it's, it's a very aggressive feeling goddess. It's a celebration of strength and power and dominance even in a way uh, with the sword and the, and the sun imagery and that kind of thing. Uh, and, you know, I look at it now and I just, I just don't feel a need to make that, <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's just an interesting aside from how it casted. There were two quilts, there were sister quilts, you know? And I think that you have to respect, you know, when you feel an urge to do something, to run off and go do it if you possibly can, but then to also accept on big projects that are huge and overwhelming and, you know, many, many months of investment and time and effort and energy, if your heart is not in it, it's okay to say no and just let yourself off the hook and not have to pursue that. And that's okay too. Um, I, I look at that image now and, you know, forged and welded and I love it. I think it's, it's still a very strong image. I just don't see it as a quilt, you know, maybe a painting, you know, where I have a lot more control over colors and placement and all that kind of good stuff, but I just don't, I don't really see it as a quilt. And that's an interesting thing. Maybe that will be the first goddess I ever do as a painting instead of a quilt. I don't know. So what evolved out of hot cast? Uh, as I constructed this quilt, and it was largely uh, a paint quilt, so how it was constructed was I basically hand appliqued her body, which is uh, black Kona cotton fabric, and I hand appliqued her hair, which is different colors of batik fabrics. And that's pretty much it. So this was very similar to uh, Release Your Light, that's another goddess quilt, where I appliqued, hand appliqued the goddess, and then left everything else up to the paint to do the job. Well, the upside of this is that you get to the quilting faster. You know, if you're in a hurry to get to the quilting and get to that design side faster, then yeah, it'll definitely get you there. Uh, but the downside is after all that quilting is done, you're not left with a finished quilt. You're left with a quilt that has almost no color other than the thread color. And that can be a hard, blank, it, it's a weird blank slate. It's not a blank slate technically, but it's still, it's just very weird. And that situation really throws me for a loop a lot of times because it will be at that stage that I get that thought in my head, I'm really not a painter, <laughs> you know? I really don't know what I'm doing when it comes to pulling out paints and starting to throw that onto a finished quilt that has taken, you know, weeks or months to knock out. So, I got started and I was of course playing with a new style of paint, the uh, Jacquard Luminaire textile paints. Got started and I believe it was right here that I did a lot of experimenting. I was playing with different colors. Well, Luminaire paints don't really mix the way other kinds of paint can mix. With Shiba paint sticks, you can, you can kind of layer colors and blend and there it's an oil-based paint. It's a very different situation. This, was not mixing well. And then when I went and tried to cover over it, it didn't cover. And so this area started to stand out like a big blotchy eyesore. So here I'd taken all this time, made this quilt, hand applicated, done the quilting, loved the quilting. The quilting process was really fun. Uh, although I do remember being a little bit bored in the sky section and not really particularly liking the design that I did. I kind of did, uh, this looks like ocean currents to me. It's a foundational design. It was tricky to fit into that area because that's not really a design that, that suits well to that. So I felt like I was, I had struggled. I had gone through that effort and then I was supposed to, it was supposed to be feeling easy, you know? And I can remember that resentment and resentment is a really toxic emotion, and I talk about that a lot. You have to be really careful when you're feeling resentful because that's a sign that there was an expectation and then that expectation was not met, and then now there's anger, you know? Why was that expectation not met? Now I'm pissed 
that I didn't get what I want or that it's not turning out the way I wanted it to uh, or I don't love myself automatically now that I made this quilt. I mean, it's, you know, it's kind of silly, but that's where my brain was at the time. That's, that's the logic that was running through my uh, 20-something year old head, right? So I remember this getting very slow and bogged down. And in, a, in the blog posts, when I read, read back through them, I, I had referenced that several times, like I have been moving very slowly and I might walk into the room and turn on the light and like paint a leaf on the columns and then walk back out again, you know? And when things slow down for me, that's a sign I'm not liking it. It's not fun. This has become drudgery. This has become, this is not meeting my expectations. Again, getting back to that resentment thing. And I'm not happy with it. So yeah, it was, it was definitely slowing down. It got a little stuck and I had to push myself to keep going. I had to shove myself through this thing. Uh, I ended up finally getting the right mix of paints to cover over the section and I don't really notice the issue any longer although if you look at the texture you can still see the texture of micro stippling between the columns there's like straight lines running through this area you can see it here there's so many layers of paint that you can't see the stitching like the paint was so thick it covered over the free motion quilting stitches uh, and it was slow. Uh, it was hard because it wasn't as much color as I liked. You know, I want a quilt to really, you know, stand out and, and draw you in. I want, I want you to catch your attention and I want you to draw you in. So release your light absolutely does that. It's blastingly bright, you know, it's kind of overwhelmingly bright and then it pulls you in. This quilt ended up being a lot more subtle and I didn't like it when I first finished it for that reason. It, you know, it was, it's also a lot more complex. There's a lot more symbolism. There's not a lot more elements to it. It's a lot more brainy in a way. You know, there's, there's, there's just a lot more structure to this quilt than my other ones. And so this was definitely a quilt where I finished it and I kind of went meh and I hung it on the wall and went meh. And then folded it up or rolled it up and, and put it into a storage tube and then didn't look at it for a couple months. And it took a couple months to kind of process through what I'd learned and to accept the fact that perfection, perfection is not necessary to love yourself. And I think that's where I was really struggling. I made mistakes in the painting. I made mistakes in the quilt itself and they were driving me nuts and I was, taking those mistakes and beating myself up about them. Like, see, you know, of course you can't love yourself. Of course you're not worthy because you can't even make a freaking quilt right. You know, like that's how negative that whole line of thinking can become. And that's why I think it's kind of dangerous. You know, it's, it's not coming from a place of gratitude of like, wow, joy, I can make this quilt. Look at this pretty quilt that I made that, I can't believe that. That is the emotion to come from. A place of gratitude and just joy at creating. So it took a few months and I put the quilt away and didn't look at it. And then when I pulled it out, I was kind of confused, <laughs> honestly. I can remember being like, why was I so upset about this? You know, you, sometimes on some quilts, you need that little bit of separation. You know, you need that distance to stop seeing every single little mistake that you're perceiving that, you know, that seems so glaringly huge when you get the quilt done that you can't see anything except that. And sometimes having that distance and separation allows you to forget that big glaring thing that you think you'll never be able to forget. And then all of a sudden it doesn't seem like such a big deal anymore. I mean, I can't tell, you know, really where that mistake in the column is. The only reason that I'm able to see it is because I could tell that's where the paint was so thick it covered the stitching. And once I had a few months of time and distance from it, I, I looked at it, I was like, well, this is exactly what I wanted. This is exactly the drawing that I drew. 
you know? Uh, it's very rare for me to be able to, to design something and have the finished quilt come out exactly like the picture in my head. And, you know, sometimes it just takes a little bit of time, a little bit of distance to be able to say, wow, you know, I did, I did that. And I did that. I did a good job. So I hope that you enjoyed this podcast episode. Find many more podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. And make sure to share the show with your friends. That really helps me out a lot. And uh, if you have happen to have time, share a review on iTunes or wherever you listen to the podcast. That helps out a lot too. Until next time, let's go quilt.